but we want to pray in the manner that you taught us. And we want to mean it from the bottom of our heart. So as we say it together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, church. Come on, amen, church. Hey, thank you so much, Lydia. I'm going to run back here and grab my little. Somebody asked me if, I, like, hey, do you want, a, do you want like, a, a normal pulpit? I was like, no, I really don't use it too much in it. It's just something I can set, my, set all my, my stuff on. I, uh, uh, I've been enjoying, I'll tell you this, uh, even while I was on my honeymoon and even the past couple weeks, these are, the, these are the cards that you wrote down the three names of people that you were anticipating if you were here in that Sunday morning service where you know, people that you were anticipating God to show up and show out in their lives. Three people that uh, you and I were gonna pray in agreement that we were gonna welcome them home. It, that's not welcome them home to invite them to church. That's welcome them home to expect and anticipate the presence of Jesus to show up and show out in their lives. And I'm telling you, I, will go, I show up every morning into my office, I grab the cards, I take my 50 cents and I go down to the youth room and I get my little Diet Coke uh, and walk back up. And I just pray. And I'll be totally honest with you. Sometimes I pray in English and sometimes I just pray in the Spirit because I know that the Spirit will pray out groanings and mysteries that I don't even know. And He's already working on the behalf of each and every one of these people, of the people you want to see Jesus welcome home. Amen? So here's what I'm going to ask you to do we're going to keep praying over them. We're going to keep praying. And I want to start hearing the testimonies of what God's doing. As I'm drinking my Diet Coke, after I paid my 50 cents to make sure I'm not taking it from the youth budget, just drinking my Diet Coke, just praying that God shows up in each and every one of those lives. Let's continue. I want to hear the testimonies of what he's doing. If this is your first time or your first time in a long time, my name is Nathan. I'm the pastor here at Salem Community Church. Uh, Kristen and I got back in town last night. We uh, have been on the, uh, it feels like the royal wedding tour. I'll just be totally honest with you. It's like we're just going around and just doing like the, the princess wave, at least I've been. She just rolls her eyes at me. and She's like, please stop. Please, please don't do that. You're embarrassing. I said, but you married me, so it's permanent. I don't know what to tell you. You, you, ha you had an option during the ceremony to get out, and you didn't take it, so here we are. Um, so we just got back in town last night from Ohio. We left on Thursday. We got back, and just a chance to see all the, all the folks up there at Rust City, uh, right outside of Youngstown, Ohio, and they all said uh, they are, appreciate each and every one of you for accepting us and letting us be part of your family. They miss us, but they know that we are here on assignment, and this is where God has planted us and plugged us in, and I'm excited to be here, so is Kristen. But we are in our series, Miraculous. Uh, I got fired up. If you couldn't tell last week, I was a little... I was a little fired up. I thought it was because I was out of pocket for a week. Typically, like if I don't preach for a week, like I'm like, I come back and I got like extra juice and I'm a little feisty and I'm ready to go. And as I was looking at the notes over the, the course of the week, I'm like, no, this wasn't just a, hey, Nathan, you're fired up and feisty because you didn't preach for a week. This like, there's something on the inside of you that this message is speaking your love language, if I can kind of use that verb. There's something about this message that's speaking speaking to the, the, the inside of me that wants to, uh, uh, wants to see God show up and just blow our minds because he's not a God of, of, of historical stories 2,000 years ago. He's not just a God uh, that he opened blind eyes back then and he opened deaf ears back then, but he's a God that absolutely wants to show up in our lives today on your job, wherever he sends you and wherever he's given you opportunity of a sphere of influence to give you a platform that you can be light in the darkness of the people around you because they need to see the miraculous. They need to see 
God show up in their lives. Come on, if you've ever seen Jesus face to face in your walk and journey with him, it's not that you're perfect, but you've had those encounters maybe at an altar or maybe in a pew or just driving down the road by yourself and the presence of Jesus so fills your vehicle or fills the moment and the space around you. That is the miraculous that he wants you to operate in every moment of your day so that when you go out on the other side of those walls, to the 52% of our county and our city that doesn't yet know him. You become a carrier of his presence. You become the catalyst for when you walk into uh, the chaos of their life and the confusion of your life. Because you're there, you're the thermostat setting the temperature for what's gonna happen. Come on, he, he, he's got each and every one of you as a conduit that does nothing. Watch this but become a, a, a pipeline from heaven to earth. I, I, you, I think, I, I thought it was just gonna be part of the intro of, of this message. I think this is becoming like a, um, just a, a, life, a, a, a life verse for me. It's, it, it's in a, that's not the message. There we go. We got like six different paper clips in here. Uh, John 5, 19, Jesus explains, so I tell you the truth, the Son of Man can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing, and whatever the Father does, the Son does also. Where was Jesus when he spoke this? On earth. Yes, okay, we'll try it again, over here. A little, little lack of caffeine on that side. Over here, where was Jesus when he spoke this? On earth. Where was the Father? So, Jesus, in the 37 documented miracles, John would then pen out in his love letter to all of humanity that the books of the world could not contain all the things that Jesus did. But of the 37 miracles, Jesus only did them because he saw the Father do them, yes? He only operated, he only moved, he only, he only made pivots in ministry based off of what he saw the Father do. So all he's doing is giving us the model of the implementation of what heaven looks like. This is, I know this because Matthew 6.10 in the King James, it's thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hear me now, is there... Is there defeat in heaven? Is there despair in heaven? Is there depression in heaven? Is there sickness in heaven? Is there lack in heaven? Anxiety. Uh, but what other, what other thing? Um, can, is cancer in heaven? Is COVID in heaven? Is a busted political system in heaven? I know, I know, right? Thank God. <laughs> Where is the rapture? <laughs> so Jesus is doing nothing and nothing but what he sees the Father doing, but everything he's doing is for the implementation on earth as it already is in heaven. So the people that he's healing, it's because the Father is saying, yes, this is what the kingdom of heaven looks like, and I want earth to be a mirror of it. So on earth, as it is in heaven, is the model for how you and I are supposed to operate, because Jesus isn't here. He gave a WWE tag team handoff to the Holy Spirit, who now resides on the inside of you, because Jesus is not omnipresent, though the Father and the Spirit are. Jesus is also also the son of man. So if Jesus had stayed with us, while well, that would have been great, if he's with me in the office on Monday morning, he's not with you in your kitchen or your car. But the Holy Spirit, who lives on the inside of you, because know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, when you said yes to Jesus, you didn't get six foot one Jesus, however tall he was, blonde haired, blue eyed, if that's your American version of Jesus, living on the inside of you. That would probably feel like a heart palpitation. Think about that, <laughs> like really, like break that down, like six foot one guy like living on your heart, that's gonna feel like a murmur at times, right? Like, I don't know, Is it, was it... Was it bad pizza? Was it bad Taco Bell? Or is it six foot one, blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus in my heart? The Holy Spirit 
resides on the inside of you. So you now operate in like manner where with Jesus did the same thing. What you see happening in heaven, you now implement it on earth. Well, Nathan, I could, Jesus was God. I could never do what he did. Jesus was son of God, yes? It's not a trick question. But he's also son of man, yes? Doesn't it feel a little, a little odd for Jesus to say, these signs and greater will you do if he's operating all the miracles as son of God? He's, if, he's, if he's operating as the son of God, it feels like, hey, I can't hit, like I have a hard time tying my shoes and you want me to like cast out devils? I have difficulty uh, like, like, Jesus, take the wheel. Like, let me take my glasses off, and it's a miracle. You've all disappeared, right? And you're telling me, Jesus, that I'm supposed, these signs and greater will I do unless he is operating as the son of man, leaning on the spirit of God, residing on the inside of him, seeing on earth in heaven what the father wants so he implements on earth as it is in heaven and so now he can look at you and not give you a great quote to live by and a great uh, wooden placard to pick up at Lions and Lambs Christian bookstore at whatever mall it is that you go to uh, th this is the it is the mantra and understanding that these signs and great it's an expectation that wherever you go the miraculous should be happening. That wherever I go, I'm a carrier of the anointing. I, I, I am a, I'm a, I house the, the creative capability of God on the, the same, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is dwelling in your mortal bodies. You don't have a watered down version of God living inside of you. You don't have a, a, a diluted version of the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is dwelling on the inside of you. So yes, he expects you to show up in the darkness of the world around you because he sent you there to be light in it and show up up not with a weak pablum mother may I woe is me victim mentality but you to show up with all victory in your hand knowing that if God is for you who can be against you knowing that you are more than a conqueror knowing that you have overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of your own testimony you are a carrier of God just want to make sure you're still here That's why I'm fired up about this message. Because it's not, miracles aren't for overseas. Miracles aren't for what we read inside here. Miracles are for you every day when you wake up. You wake up with the expectancy of, God, what, what cool thing do you want to do today? What do you, where are you sending me? Watch, watch, where, where, where are you, uh, where are you, if the footsteps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord, yes? It's the Bible, it's, it's in there, I promise, right? If the footsteps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord, if he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths, that means when you get up and you start walking around, guess what? You're walking in the will of God. You're, you're walking in his authority. Watch. So you show up to work as an ambassador. What's an ambassador? Uh, right here, right here. An ambassador. An accredited diplomat sent by a country as its official representative to a foreign country. You show up, watch, and you carry the weight and authority of the kingdom you represent. It, 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 worst case scenario, hear me out. Like wherever there are uh, nas national embassies, if there's an attack 
on the ambassador or the embassy. It is an absolute attack on the sovereign nation that ambassador and embassy represent. So guess what? When the enemy starts attacking you, it's not you versus the enemy. Let's go back to David and Goliath. It's the covenant that you carry versus the adversary in your life. When you show up and you start getting hit by arrows of the enemy, you don't have to figure, God, what am I going to do? Oh, my goodness. This is terrible. This is awful. All you have to do is like, whoa, time out. I need to go back to the covenant that I have and recognize that I'm a carrier of the presence of God and no weapon formed against me shall prosper, but every tongue that rises up in judgment, I shall condemn. It's my heritage. I want you to think about that. You're not a victim. We've got, whoa, in 2021, if we could throw off this woe is me victim mentality, you are a victor. Has God ever lost a battle? Think about it. I mean, just like, and I'm like, you know, just don't agree with me because it's like, you know, I can obviously be the loudest because Levi can help me with the decibels and the microphone. I get that. Have you ever heard of a time of God losing a battle? So, if God before you, if he is for you, if he's in your corner, if he's the biggest cheerleader you've got, who can be against you? Think about that now. It, it, makes, it makes everything start to shift in mindset. I, I'm not saying COVID's not real. I'm just saying God's bigger. I'm not saying cancer's not real. I'm just saying God's bigger. I'm not saying depression's not real. I'm just saying God is bigger. I'm not saying anxiety's not real. I'm just saying God's bigger. And so at some point, I have to surrender. And I'm not saying that bad things won't happen because Jesus promised it. If we're gonna stand on the promises of God, yes, blessing, yes, favor. Oh my goodness, he loves me. It's, uh, you know, uh, the overwhelming, reckless love of God. It's great, all these promises. He also promised that you would have trouble and tribulation. I would, I would like to not claim that one, God. Like, if you're giving me options here, like, can I not check the box on that one? In this world, you will have tribulation. You'll have trouble. But fear not. Why? For I have overcome the world. Think about that. Think about that. You're an ambassador. Let's take it a step further. Let's just, let's just nudge our toes up to the, the edge of the diving board before we take a leap of faith. You're not just an ambassador, you're a priest. I want you to think about that. You're a priest. You, you, you speak a thing when it's lined up with this. Remind ye, Isaiah or Jeremiah, one of the two, remind ye me of my words. It will not return to me void of power. It will accomplish what I've sent it to do. So when you start, when you step up at that moment, you're a priest. You're not a teacher. You're a priest. You're not a stay-at-home mom that's beneath your calling. And I'm not, I'm not saying anything against stay-at-home moms. I'm just saying you're a priest in your home. You're not, a, you're not, just, you're not just, let me say it this way, it's better. You're not just a stay-at-home mom. You're not just a teacher. You're not just a business owner. You're not just whatever it is that God has given you opportunity to pay your bills because he's the one that gives us every good and perfect thing comes down from the Father above. You're not, just a, you're not just a student. You're a priest in your school and in your classroom. You, you carry the weight of all my, the God that said light be and light became. Out of nothing, something, that you carry that same spirit on the inside of you. It, it, it's like it, if the apex, the climax, the culmination of our religious experience is a gold star, Richie Hayes, for church, uh, perfect church attendance. He always got him. I never got him. It's always that one Sunday I was out. If that's the climax, the apex, the culmination 
of our religious experience, we are doing ourselves a disservice because he's called us to be priests. Why? Because 52% on the other side of our pretty stained glass don't yet know him, have not yet experienced the love of God, have not yet experienced the goodness of God that is tracking them down. He is not mad at them. He's mad about them. He's not bothered by them. He's pushed, he is moving heaven and hell to get to them, so he sends you to do it. There's 52%. On the other side of that wall that don't, they need the miraculous. They don't need church attendees. Attending church has never healed the sick. Attending, and I'm not, forsake not the assemblings of you, I'm I'm not saying that. Like, this is where we get filled up. My job is not to get your neighbor saved. My job is to equip you for the work of the ministry. My job is not to get your coworker saved. I don't know your coworker, but you do. Look at you, boo boo. Look who God wants to use on your job and in your sphere of influence. It's my job to equip you. It's my job to get you fired up to take on hell with a squirt gun. That's what it's about. Like, I'm, I'm going to love when, when they give us access to go over to the high school and the middle school and go hang out with our, our teens and our young people. I told Myronelle, it's the day that I show up and I make sure I put extra lotion on my tattoos so they are just bright. Because the kids are like, who's that dude with like the beard and the skinny jeans and the tattoos? Oh, that's my pastor. What? Your pastor looks like? That is not what my pastor looks like. Does he wear a robe? Nope. Does he wear a stole? He jokes about it, but he doesn't. <laughs> Yet, I have joked about wearing a robe and a stole, just to, free, just to mess with people. I want to show up because why? I want, hear me. I don't mean this literally, but I do spiritually, literally. I want to show up to incite our students to start a spiritual riot on the inside of their classrooms where they go in and whatever hell is attacking the kids around them, because they're there, the miraculous starts to happen. Because you, I want to get you so fired up that you can't wait for Monday morning to get in your car, go to your job, and just start looking for devils to cast out. We can do that? Yes! Yes! I don't have like some special degree from seminary and Bible college. Of, did, he, did he take the class on casting out devils? Okay, got it. Did he, did he take the class on, on preaching to Muslims uh, on the street corner in Bujumbura, Burundi, so that blind eyes start popping open? He did? Okay, check. You can do it! You can do it. You can. And it's not... It's not about your, uh, can we just please, I love the Lord's Prayer, I really do, but I am so, I am so worried that it's become a King James routine and rhythm that we just repeat and there is no power on the inside of it because it's just like, yeah, uh, you know, just, just, just go through it, like, come on, there's power, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is there depression in heaven? So why is there depression in your home? Is there sickness in heaven? Like, yeah, no one wants to answer anymore. (laughs) They're like, oh, he's gonna call us out on it. (laughs) There's no sickness in heaven, so maybe that's why he's giving you the job that you have so that you can show up and you can be a beacon of light in the lives of the people around you because he needs your voice to simply repeat what he says. You don't have what it takes to fix anyone, but you have access to the one who can. You're just the one opening the door. That's all you're doing. 
Jesus gave, God gave authority to humanity in Genesis. Okay? Why do bad things happen to good people? We live in a terrible world. Can I say it the way I want to? Can I just, without, I'm probably offended. Like, we live in a sucky world, okay? I'm sorry, I just offended like a lot of, just calm down, Alice. It's my grandmother's name. I wasn't thinking of anyone's name in here. She's passed. May the Lord bless her and keep her. She knows Jesus. She's in heaven. I love you, Grandma. We live in a terrible world. And humanity, Adam and Eve, gave authority to Lucifer, who became El Diablo. That's Spanish for the devil. Right? But Jesus took back the authority at Calvary. That's why he died as the son of man. So that he could give then to you the authority that he took back from El Diablo. The devil, is that right? All right, just making sure I was appropriate in my bilingualness. That's, so why are bad things happening around me? Why are you not quoting more scripture? Why? Ooh, I know. It's like that's super quiet. Why? Because I have to take ownership in the influence that he's given me to be light in their darkness. How much authority am I walking in? Or am I just thinking this on Sunday morning is good enough? For, for my religious experience. Why do I want to go to the high school? Because I want our students to realize that they're carriers of power, real power, devil eradicating power, cancer removing power, depression defeating power because they can operate in the miraculous. That's why. That's why. What do I want to talk about this morning? The feeding of the 5,000. It's the only miracle that happened in all three synoptic gospels, gospels and in the love letter to John. The three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they are in sync with one another. John's doesn't follow the pattern in makeup because John, he is the disciple, like he titled himself, which, hey, kudos to you if you're gonna write a book, why not? The, the disciple whom Jesus loved, his is written uh, in more of a love letter to all of humanity. But this specific, this specific miracle is the only of the 37 documented miracles that we see in all four gospels, the three synoptics and then the one love letter to John, uh, one love letter to all humanity. There are some really, really cool things I, I wanna point out. There's basically four really cool things. They show up, the, the Bible counts them. Jesus, Jesus is actually trying to get away because John the Baptist, his cousin, has been beheaded. He's in a posture of grieving, but people see where he's going. I don't know if they had like a GPS tracker on his iPhone 12 Pro. I don't know what the, I don't know if he left his, like, uh, his, his position on, on his Snapchat or whatever it was. People were tracking wherever he, probably Peter got a hold of his Twitter and was like posting stuff on Jesus' Twitter account. And so people were like, oh, he's going over that way. So then 5,000 people show up. And if you wanna be honest about it and wanna look, for, look at it from a theological perspective, they only counted the men. So the men that were of marrying age was 5,000 ladies. I'm sorry, it was a different time, a different class that wouldn't have included the women nor the children. Scholars believe it could have been upwards of 20 to 25,000 people in this moment. That's pretty cool. The, here's what, they all show up and Jesus in the Gospel of Luke starts to, it, he starts to talk to them about the kingdom of heaven. He starts teaching them the principles, like what I just did for 15 minutes on the kingdom of heaven to get them fired up, and then starts operating in miracles. We don't know how many, we don't know what kind. The disciples didn't write them down. But what we do know is there comes a moment where there's the recognition that there is lack. They have no food. 
It's interesting. They're following Jesus, yes? 5,000. Could be 20 to 25,000. Following the presence of Jesus. And they still have issues in their life. Just because we said yes to Jesus doesn't mean that life all of a sudden becomes easy. Just because you're following him, it doesn't mean that everywhere you go it's gonna smell like roses. And all of a sudden, ma'am, your husband's going to start picking up his socks and underwear off the floor just because he said yes to Jesus. I can't promise you that. I saw some spouses. <laughs> Just because you said yes to Jesus, guess what? It means life actually gets harder now. Out of the 20 to 25,000 people are following Jesus and they all have issues. I feel like I'm in good company. Because if they're following Jesus and they still have issues, that makes me feel a whole lot better about myself that I'm following Jesus, trying to, trying to do the best that I can, trying to be a, a good husband to Kristen and trying to be a good pastor to this church and trying to be a good leader in our community. And I still got issues. I still got problems. It makes me feel good to know that life and lack, or lack and life still happens even if you're following Jesus. I know it's difficult. I'm not, I'm not saying, it yet. like, guess what? Your name got on the devil's Rolodex when you finally said yes to Jesus. And not yes to church attendance. I will hammer that till my dying day, Myron L. I am not interested in church attendance. I'm interested in radical relationship with Jesus. When you make that turn and have a conversion in your life where he becomes the filter through which you, uh, but, but to me, uh, it's in, in him I live, move, and have my being. When that happens, you make the devil's Rolodex. Young people, that's like, um, what is that on your phone? Favorites. It's like your favorites on your phone, okay? You just made the favorites in the enemy's iPhone. If you have an Android, I don't know how you live. Just kidding. Lack in life happens. Doesn't matter if you're following Jesus. Lack in life happens. Here's the, here's the next thing I wanna point out is uh, Jesus looks at the large crowd. He's looking at all of this that's going on. And they start saying, hey, we got like 20,000 people here. Jesus, it's a Sunday and Chick-fil-A is not open today. The Lord's chicken, Right? I don't know nothing about that Popeye's. Jesus, take the wheel on some KFC. If you work at KFC in customer service, we need to have a conversation. That's a different story. But KFC wasn't open, obviously. Burger King wasn't open, obviously. McDonald's wasn't open. Like, this wasn't a day and age. Think about it. Can we contextualize this? There was no Applebee's or Shoney's to go to after church. There was no catfish house. No one had a crock pot at home with the roast going, right? So when they said, we need to let these people go because there's no food, it was already late in the day, that means more than likely people were not going to eat that evening because you had to, you couldn't go to food line and pick up a loaf of bread and peanut butter and jelly. Like, like let's, let's take it out of 2021 a third world country would do a lot of us real good to figure out life is not as kosher. <laughs> okay? So Jesus looks at them, his disciples, and says, he said, uh, lifting up, now the Passover was the feast of the Jews, lifting up his eyes, Jesus, seeing the large crowd that was coming to him. Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Verse six says, he said this to test him, Philip, for he himself knew what he would do. Now, yes, Jesus will test you. He will. He won't tempt you. First Corinthians, 
and James, Paul and James, the half-brother of Jesus, both are very specific that God will not tempt you. But Jesus, yes, will test you to see how willing are you to throw caution to the wind and step, Peter, step out of the boat and do the impossible and walk on water. He will absolutely test you. He will absolutely put you in situations, right? I'm not saying God gives bad things to us, but he will let us get right up to the edge of the boat, close enough that he's like, all right, if you're gonna step over the edge, Peter, come on, joker. Lord, if it's you, bid me come, King James. NIV, Nathan's interpreted version. All right, come on, fool. Step over the boat. Let's see what happens. He will absolutely test you. He'll absolutely test you know what? A little pressure is good for us. A little pressure is good for us. Why? Because it causes us. It's going to do one of two things. You're either going to throw caution to the wind and just wholeheartedly trust the presence of Jesus. Or you're going to start freaking out when the storms of life come and he's asleep on the bow of the boat and you go wake him up. God, Jesus, don't you care that we're drowning? Are you drowning? Are you? Like, first of all, I'm here, so this thing can't drown. Think about that. Yeah, Jesus will test us at times. He'll, he'll allow a little bit of pressure to see, watch, because pressure gauges how much we've grown. It does. A little bit of pressure is good for you, where you're just like, hey, all right, we, Jesus, we got this. Not I've got this. We've got this. He will test you. And that's okay. He already knew what he was going to do. And think, Philip was from that area. Philip knew. Instead of, instead of Philip's answer was like, we don't even have enough money to buy this. We, there's no supermarkets. Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays, Jesus. What, what are you talking about? And That's everything that he's responding with instead of saying, Jesus, whatever you want to do in this situation where life and lack are happening, whatever you want to do, Jesus, I'm in. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I'm in because you're in it. Think about that. Jesus, I don't know how this situation, I don't know how this doctor's report is going to turn out, but if you're in it with me, I'm in it. Jesus, I don't know how this political debacle, and I don't care what side of the aisle you voted on, I'm not interested in your political affiliation. Both sides have it wrong. That was a moment to clap. You don't have to clap now. Don't worry about it. People online are clapping. Hey, Jesus, if you're in it with me, I'm in it all the way. That, he will test you. He, guess what? Guess what a little bit of testing did? The, the church grew the most when it was persecuted in the first century. A little bit of testing is good for us. Ever been to the gym? Worked out? Got swole? Like, boom! Just kidding. All right? You pick up a bar that has no weight, guess what? Nothing happens. You pick up a bar that has weight and you start to push against the resistance, what happens? You start to grow. It hurts. It's a struggle, but you get stronger. Yes, Jesus will test you. I got two more right here. Uh, we're gonna come up and, and she's gonna, uh, Lydia's gonna start to play underneath me. It's gonna make me sound so much nicer, so much more spiritual. I'll stop talking about Chick-fil-A, I promise. Third thing right here, beware performance-based religion. We can read this story and think that the little boy who brought his, his little plastic lunchbox, mine had transformers on it, it was red with a white handle and had like Optimus Prime on it and had like the matching little thermos thing that you unscrew. Like I don't know if kids have like uh, lunchboxes like that anymore. Maybe there's like antiques or something. Check it out. This kid shows up with five pieces 
of bread, just call them crackers, showed up with five crackers and two fish. These were not like 500 pound mackerels, right? This wasn't like some deep sea fishing excursion. He showed up with five crackers and two sardines. That's what this kid showed up with. No one else packed a lunch but this kid. And then Jesus steals his lunch. Think about it. Hey, he's got food, bring it over. We'll take care of you. And we can think that because that kid did the right thing, that God responded to him doing the right thing. And what happens is we start to formulate a pattern where we think our performance is, 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 the, uh, is what stipulates how much God moves in our life. Man, if you hear anything from me right now, God is not interested in performance-based religion. It, just because you, you get it right for enough consecutive days, you, we, you wake up and you're like, oh, we're good. God, you're with me. No, he was there when you tripped and fell three days ago. He's, he still loves you in spite of the mess of your life. He still loves you regardless of how bad you've blown it. He still loves you. But we think that this kid out of the other 20 to 25,000, that's the one, that's because he was there, God showed up. And we internalize that, that means I have to show up and always have my lunch. I have to show up. If I stumble, God's gonna be mad at me. If I, if I stub my toe and catch my pinky toe on the, the corner of the couch, and say everything but praise God from whom all blessings flow? If I get mad and I kick the dog, not Max, Kristen's dog. I would never kick Max. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? We think that the moment we drop the ball, the Holy Spirit, whew, he's out. We think that the moment we cuss, He's gone. We think that the moment we have a lustful or perverse thought that God is running a 40 yard dash away from us. We think that the moment we start to screw up and we make a mistake that all of a sudden we have to start looking out to make sure that God's not gonna throw a lightning bolt at us like he's some angry, uh, far removed entity out in the cosmos. He is an ever present help and he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. God loves you and he is not mad at you and to hell with performance-based religion that the better I am and the better I do, the more God loves me. He loves me when I get it right. I'm so thankful. He loves me when I get it wrong. He, what can separate you from the love of God? neither height nor depth. If I make my bed in the heavens, you're there. And if I make the stupidest decisions of my life and I make my bed in hell, you are still there. Come on, this week I want you, I want every time you screw up, because guess what? Newsflash, you're gonna screw up. It might be this afternoon. I don't know, I'm not like prophesying to you or anything like that, I'm just, you're, you're going to screw up. You're gonna have a judgmental thought. You're, someone's gonna cut you off in traffic and you're gonna wave at them with one finger. Don't act like you don't. Don't act like you don't start screaming at the person in front of you while you're driving down Riverside Drive. Oh, you're so holy, okay, thanks. 
I'm like, come on, can we just be a little honest because fake is exhausting? Don't act like you're not gonna screw up. Don't act like your spouse isn't gonna annoy you this week. Yeah, oh, wait, time out. <laughs> Take my glasses off so I can't see. I did not see that, Gary Austin. <laughs> I don't even know if Gary's here. <laughs> but when you screw up, can, can you just do your best to remember, beware of performance-based religion? Because he's still with you and he's not mad at you. Last thing, I'm, I'm, I'm landing the plane right here. 20 to 25,000 people had a need, yes? 20 to 25,000 had a need. Because Jesus was there, everyone's need is met. That's the miracle. Let me, let me break that down for you. If you see God moving, think about it. If this room is packed out, 521 seats, plus a choir, plus the band. Let's say we got 600 people in here and God starts moving over here, manifesting a miracle that everyone's need is getting met. Think about it contextually. Did everyone start to eat at the same time? Probably not, because it was the 12 disciples that were handing out the food, yes? So what if they started over here and you start to see God showing up and meeting needs. How ridiculous is it if you're on the last row over here and you're, you're watching God move and you throw your hands up and say, well, he's not doing it for me. Everyone's need was met. 